Right. Hello, everybody. My name is Andrew Kalnan. I am the Associate Director of Alumni Relations at Dickinson, um, coming to you from Central PA, which is very snowy tonight. I um, hope everybody is doing well, and thank you for joining us for um, Wine 101 Part 2 with Dwight File, Class of 06. Um, super excited for him to be back again and to do a second presentation for us on wine. Um, we're really thankful for him and um, looking forward to this presentation. So without further ado, I'm going to turn it over to Dwight and um, we'll get drinking. <laughs> definitely, definitely. Hello, everyone. Uh, I hope everyone can hear me clearly, see me clearly. Uh, is that the case? Andrew, we're good on our end? Yep, we are good. Excellent, excellent. So um, welcome, everyone. Cheers. Uh, my name is Dwight File. Um, I graduated from uh, Dickinson College in 2006, um, started in 2002. Um, I found my love for wine um, back about three years ago, maybe four years ago, um, while studying for a certification for my project management uh, professional. And uh, I was uh, completely confused when I walk into the uh, liquor store. Um, I saw a bunch of bottles uh, with a bunch of labels on them um, and really had no idea uh, what I was doing um, outside of how much money was going to come outside of my pocket. Um, and so um, when I took that bottle, that first bottle home, um, I uh, did some research on it uh, to try to figure out what uh, the actual grape was, um, what the alcohol percentage was, who the producer was, etc. cetera. Um, and it, I fell in love with doing that research um, and then consistently went to the shop, uh, consistently went to the stores and the wineries and, and, and found myself a new love. Um, you know, I wanted to be the best possible consumer uh, I, I could, the most informed uh, consumer that I possibly could. Um, and so uh, that allowed me to kind of fall in love with this beverage. Um, and I started studying for my certification there um, through WSET um, over this past year. Um, and uh, I'm super excited to be sharing my love and passion uh, for this beverage with you all. Um, so I'm not, I can't see you, um, but I, I assume that there may be uh, some folks who were um, on uh, our first kind of installation of one on one back in April. Um, but if not, I'll go through quickly kind of like a high level uh, summary of what we covered uh, back in April. Um, and you'll see that I've prepared a, a, a few slides um, that are not too complicated, but uh, hopefully uh, allow you to kind of get the point uh, of, of, of uh, where we're going to go. Um, and, you know, wine at the end of the day is simply uh, grapes, right? We don't want to uh, overcomplicate this thing. Um, they are grapes uh, that are pressed um, into a bottle um, and designed for us to enjoy. Um, a lot of folks may feel like uh, this is something that's meant to be uh, overly complicated and fancy, um, but really at the end of the day, uh, it isn't. Um, it's, it's something that uh, definitely has layers um, and a lot of complexity. Um, at the end of the day, you don't need to dive into all of those layers and complexity to enjoy the beverage. Um, and that's what I feel is so, so special about it. Um, so what I wanted to kind of cover today were some of the very uh, uh, basics. Um, and as you know, we have certain senses. Um, we have our eyes, we have our nose, uh, we have our tongue or mouths, um, and eyes obviously allow us to see. All right. So I've seen that at the end of the uh, at the uh, end of the chat, we had uh, several different uh, varietals um, and, and different wines that uh, folks are enjoying tonight. Um, I love seeing that. But what I want you to do um, from the very, very start here is, is kind of uh, look at your glass. OK, um, so hold your glass up and observe the color of the wine um, and anything else that you feel may go uh, uh, may be happening in your specific glass, all right? Uh, one of the things that we uh, can determine from uh, the color or from our sight um, is the age of the wine. Um, so we can tell if a wine is old or we can tell if a wine is young. Uh, usually in red wines, uh, when uh, uh, a wine is uh, older, it loses uh, color, all right? So this wine, if you can see in my glass, it's pretty dark. 
um, and uh, bright. And so it's going to uh, be a young wine. Uh, and by young wine, we mean typically three to five years of age, um, if, not, if not a little less than that. Um, uh, white wines kind of gain pigment, right? So if they start out very, very light, I don't have a white wine here for you, um, but they will gain color. Um, so uh, you'll notice in a, in a young wine, a 2018 vintage uh, or 2019 vintage, and what I mean by vintage is when the grapes were actually harvested, uh, those wines will typically be very, very light in color. Um, but as they gain age over time, uh, they start to get more golden or honey. Um, and that's something that we can tell right off the top um, just by our site is the age uh, of the wine. Um, you may also be able to tell the type of wine it is, all right, once you get really, really good at, at, at blind tasting. Um, so you can tell uh, if a wine is, uh, or a grape uh, is a thin skin grape or a thick skin grape. Uh, so if you're able to see through uh, your red wine, for example, it's going to be a, a cooler climate, thin skin uh, grape. Um, if you're unable to see through uh, your red wine, for example, um, you will uh, be a, have a thicker skinned uh, grape and uh, it will be typically from a uh, moderate to warm climate, all right? Um, you can also tell uh, the viscosity of a specific wine. So let's think about viscosity uh, as, as uh, uh, milk, for example. Uh, so your more viscous wines would be your whole milk, right, in terms of texture and mouthfeel. Um, and then uh, your less viscous wines would be that skim milk, right? And right around the middle, uh, medium viscosity would be that 2%, 1% uh, in terms of mouthfeel. Um, what we typically do uh, when we're drinking wine is we swirl uh, to let the uh, the wine breathe, right, or let oxygen be introduced into your glass. And what's that going? What that's going to do is uh, bring forth more aromas, right? It's going to lift that wine a little bit more um, and allow you to get the full flavor profile of that specific wine. All right. Um, so the kind of the next part of this would be um, our nose. Okay. Um, you'll often hear the phrase on the nose. Um, and uh, then on the palate, uh, we'll start with the nose first. So if you have your wine uh, glass ready and some people use stems, some people don't, uh, some people just use uh, regular cups, uh, but we know that uh, uh, regular wine glasses uh, typically will allow for the best expression of that specific wine uh, to happen um, because of the way that it's made and the surface area that's allowed um, in the specific glass. Uh, where, but go ahead and put your nose in if you can. Okay, and what you want to do is kind of just close your eyes for a second and think about the things that you're actually smelling um, in the wine, right? So do you get any kind of floral notes? Um, a floral uh, kind of note would be blossom, rose, or violet, um, those types of things. Uh, do you get any fruit, any kind of fruit um, so is the fruit green uh, or tree fruit like a, an apple or a pear? Um, could it be citrusy? Um, so grapefruit, lemon, limes, oranges. Um, typically you'll see those citrus, citrus fruits um, in, in the uh, uh, white wines um, and more of your uh, our dark fruit like berries, cherries um, in red wines. Okay, um, but there are several different uh, things that you can kind of pick up. So in my wine right here, and I'll show you what I'm drinking. I have a Cabernet uh, Sauvignon, um, and this is uh, called the Burn, Born of Fire, Cabernet Sauvignon, and it's the 2017 vintage from Columbia Valley, and Columbia Valley is in Washington State, right? Um, really, really excellent bottle. Um, and um, one of the kind of new, newer kind of appellations or uh, more trendy appellations as of, uh, uh, of the past five to 10 years. Um, but what I'm getting on this nose here is just a lot of like red fruit. So red cherries really coming through um, almost like uh, the baked condition. And when we talk about 
when we talk about uh, 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 wine, um, the fruit can be uh, different conditions, right? So um, there is typically, uh, uh, you all know, a fruit can be uh, kind of a dry fruit, a fresh fruit, um, and underripe fruit. Uh, if you ever go to a grocery store um, and you're walking past that fruit aisle, if you're, you're smelling the fruit uh, uh, from, from far away, that means it's really, really ripe or even bruised. Um, then, and you have the dry fruit, the kind of like candied almost uh, uh, kind of fruit that you find like in your craisins, for example. All those types of uh, uh, pre, uh, flavor profiles or aromas end up in a glass um, in terms of what you can actually pick up. Um, and, you know, one of those kind of myths that exist um, is that these specific things are actually in the wine. Right. And, uh, you know, if you have been a want around this beverage uh, long enough, you know that that is uh, definitely not the case, um, even though wine can be made really with any specific fruit um, in terms of what we're dealing with, you know, on the most serious of levels, um, it's only grapes and grapes that are made from the Vitis vinifera um, variety of vine. OK, um, so. On the nose, I hope you were able to kind of determine uh, 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 specific uh, types of aromas, like I said, any kind of floral notes, uh, green fruit notes, stone fruits. Stone fruits would include uh, uh, fruits that may have a large seed in them, so um, uh, apricot, uh, 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 peaches. Uh, nectarines, those types of things. Tropical fruit uh, may even be your pineapples, papaya, melon. Um, those, those, those types of fruits would be included um, right there. Um, I'm not able to see you, obviously, but I, I hope that um, there is a solid mix of, uh, of uh, varietals and wine offerings that you have there as well. Um, so let's go ahead and sip and taste. If you haven't already, <clears throat> please do now. And again, you know, when it comes to uh, uh, a wine or food and beverage in general, right? If something smells good, it generally tastes good. Um, and, and so a lot of times our nose does match up um, with the palate, what you get um, on the tongue, but sometimes it doesn't. Um, and that's completely okay. Um, you know, there's some more abstract kind of uh, descriptors and aromas that actually exist um, in wine. And, you can pick up specifically in some of the more unique varietals, um, uh, like Carmenere, for example. Um, you're going to get more like green pepper, uh, minty, eucalyptus types of notes. Um, in a Pinot Noir, uh, you can even get uh, kind of mushrooms or potting soil, um, or what we call um, in the industry a forest floor, uh, right? So that decaying type of leaf uh, that actually exists. Um, if you go through the forest. Um, those are the types of things that do come out um, in specific wines um, and that may match up with your nose or just may appear on the palate. Um, it's, it's really completely in, uh, individual um, and somewhat subjective, uh, but there are systems that are put in place um, for us to kind of understand all these things um, as a whole. Um, so I hope that you're able to kind of experience that uh, very, very individually um, and that the wine that you're drinking you feel is palatable and something that um, you'd come back to. Um, I'm not sure if anyone was able to uh, pick up some of the wines that I did suggest um, to, to Andrew to share out, um, but uh, hopefully um, in the future you will be able to. Um, what I wanted to do is kind of decode um, uh, some of the wine labels that I actually have present in my home. Um, and if you are new to wine, um, if you are uh, um, at the basic level, if you're a beginner, um, hopefully this will kind of uh, uh, break the ice for you and you'll be able to be able to um, uh, select uh, wines uh, that are more fitting for your palate. Um, and, and uh, never uh, feel nervous when it comes to se uh, selecting a wine um, at a restaurant, hopefully when uh, we're able to get back to restaurants in the future, okay? So let's dive in here and I'll stop uh, screen sharing for the moment so that you can just see me. 
Um, so a couple basic things around decoding a wine label, okay? Um, when you decode a wine label, first off, there's like three separate ways that wines are pr presented to you um, in a shop. Uh, one is through the actual uh, grape varietal. Uh, two is by the specific region. Um, and then three, it just may be a random name, a made up name, um, an imaginary name, but it represents um, what the producer feels the wine uh, uh, expresses, okay? So uh, let's start here with um, the most uh, complicated, I would say. And this is the the uh, old world, right? And so when we talk about old world wines, we're typically talking about uh, uh, Europe as a whole. So Italy, Spain, Portugal, uh, France, okay? And here I have actually a French bottle and I'll, I'll, I'll zoom into uh, the bottle as best I can. I know you may be uh, seeing a little bit backwards, but uh, what you'll notice about uh, this bottle uh, right off the top is that you won't uh, know what grapes are in this specific bottle just by uh, uh, reading the label. And this is something that actually puts a lot of people off who are new uh, because they don't really know what they're buying. Uh, and you really have to kind of get into geography um, and in history in order to understand some of these things. But let's start from the top. Okay, so 2018. Right. When you see uh, a specific number like this on the bottle, a year, right, this represents the vintage, right? This means that in 2018, this is when these grapes specifically were harvested. Okay. And then they were put in this bottle. Now, a current release could be a 2018, meaning not every year that the grapes are harvested, they're going to be available and ready in your shop. Um, but they can be um, specifically for, for, for grapes that are meant to be drunk young, but some like this 2010 Vina Tondonia um, is a uh, current release right now, meaning they've had this um, in their cellar basically uh, for uh, 10 years and they're just now releasing this to the public. Um, and that's based on, you know, tradition. Uh, and and, and you typically see those traditional types of methods, um, for lack of a better term, uh, in the old world, in Europe. Uh, but get, to get back to kind of decoding this. So 2018, we're talking about vintage years uh, that the grapes uh, were harvested. Um, Elizabeth Chamberlain, right, this would be the producer, all right, and this, this comes from France, right, and this is the specific uh, town or and or region or appellation, right? Um, so this is a Chateauneuf de Pop. Uh, Chateauneuf de Pop essentially translates to the, uh, the King's New Castle um, or the Pope's New Castle, all right? Um, and then under this, I, I know it's kind of very difficult to see, but uh, it says basically appellation, the control A, right? This is the body that determines what kinds of grapes are allowed to be produced in this specific region, right? So uh, some of you are, may already know that Chateauneuf de Pop is a Grenache, Syrah, and Vedra uh, based blend, right? And those are three different grapes um, that exist that are, 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 are very, very popular in this region and very, very popular in France. Um, and it makes a full-bodied red wine. Uh, that's really, really elegant and uh, can be uh, extremely expensive, um, but it's a really, really high quality uh, product. Um, and this is the type of label that you'll come across typically um, in France overall, okay? I could show you another example of a white uh, from France, and this is Chablis, right? And this may be a more familiar uh, 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 varietal to you all, or grape, um, in that it is Chardonnay, right? It's a Chardonnay grape. Chardonnay is mainly gro uh, grown in Chablis. Um, and in Chablis, uh, they make uh, these wines, uh, Chardonnay, without that oak, 
Uh, it's typically in stainless steel uh, fermentation process. So um, you're not going to get those buttery kinds of notes that you get uh, out in uh, Napa Valley or California uh, or, in the, you know, some of the new world, you're going to get um, these more kind of tropical uh, melony, uh, mineral uh, uh, types of uh, flavor profiles on this specific kind of Chardonnay. And again, it's meant to be drunk young. So this is a 2018, again, uh, uh, release, current release, um, and 2018 vintage. All right, so this is a white wine, it's Chardonnay. Again, things that you may not have known, um, you know, just walking through as a beginner. Um, but if you look these things up and you're good with maps, you'll be able to figure out exactly what it is that you're purchasing at a specific time. Um, so these are specific examples of wines that are um, uh, wine labels that exist with the specific region on them. Now here in the States, um, and then uh, many other uh, uh, places in the new world. So it's basically everywhere that produces wine other than uh, uh, Europe. Um, we, we tend to be a little bit more uh, uh, direct, right? So here you'll see the exact place, uh, the Willamette Valley. Um, the uh, producer is here, Averain, um, uh, the state from Oregon, and it is Pinot Noir, right? Uh, and I think, you know, when, when you're first getting into uh, wine, uh, domestic wines uh, are, are, are very, very easy to, to get into. They can be somewhat, um, you know, predictable at the basic level. Um, and you know, you'll be able to uh, inform, make informed decisions, make informed uh, uh, consumer decisions, um, you know, going forward, if you stick to kind of this, uh, a type of uh, labeling. Um, you can really, really diversify your palate this way as well, um, right? So if you are, are, are purchasing a Pinot Noir from Oregon and you purchase another one from California um, and you go to the different regions in California, uh, you'll start to see differences. Um, and a lot of those differences, as we talked about um, in our first installation, exist based on um, the terroir, right? Uh, where the wine actually comes from. Um, how the, uh, the grapes uh, and the vines are growing, uh, the type of slope that it's on, um, the type of season, um, uh, growing season that exists in that specific vintage or that specific year. Um, so again, this is a, a wine uh, that is pretty direct, uh, producer that is direct. Here we, again, uh, can see exactly what we're buying right off the top just by looking at it. It is a Pinot Noir. It's a thin skin grape. Um, and this one specifically comes from uh, the uh, Willamette Valley. Um, you'll also notice too that uh, a lot of American producers do put some level of description about the wine and or producer or the way that the wine was actually produced on the back. All right. Uh, I know when I first started um, in wine, I was looking for them to tell me, was I going to get, you know, red fruit on this wine? Was it going to be uh, a dry wine? Was it going to be a sweet wine? Um, you know, all of those types of things. Uh, a lot of times, you know, if you go to your just basic liquor store, um, you'll see, you know, kind of these uh, descriptors on the back. All right. And then finally, uh, when it comes to decoding a wine label, we have uh, the made up name, all right? And this is a wine um, that is, is pretty mysterious. It's called VDR um, and VDR uh, stands for very dark red, all right? So right off the top you know, of my mind, what I'm thinking about is that this is going to be a, a type of blend of sorts. Um, and it's going to be a full body blend. And if we look at the back here, again, they're going to tell you in more detail what it is. So if it's proprietary, that means that it belongs specifically to this specific producer, which is the Scheid family. Um, and they're using this specific blend. They're not necessarily telling you exactly what that blend is, um, but it is again, a 2018 vintage. So this is a younger wine um, and it's from Monterey, California. Okay, um, there also is a made up name here for uh, 
the wine that I'm drinking tonight, the Born of Fire, uh, coming from the Burn, which is the the Burn is is, is the uh, uh, appellation that it comes from, um, and and the region is Columbia Valley, as I mentioned a little bit earlier. Um, this is the 2017 uh, vintage, uh, but here you see on the bottle they actually tell you the specific single varietal or grape that it is, Cabernet Sauvignon. Uh, what's important to note is that. Uh, out of uh, uh, there about 75% um, of you know, the world's plantings are made of about 100 or so grapes. Uh, but uh, there are over 1,300 varietals or grapes, different types of grapes that are used to make wine. Um, and, and there are even more species of grapes um, that actually exist, but 1,300 that we can actually recognize. Um, so it, it's pretty, pretty extensive. Um, I saw somebody in the chat mention that they were drinking a Bordeaux, right? And, and Bordeaux, again, is a region. Uh, and, and the most popular uh, parts of, of Bordeaux, you're going to have the left bank and you're going to have the right bank. Right, um, and one of those banks, right, the left bank is going to be that uh, a Cabernet uh, Sauvignon dominant uh, type of blend, and on the right bank you're going to have the Merlot uh, dominant blend. It's made up of six different grapes, um, specifically, uh, so Cabernet Sauvignon, uh, Cabernet Franc, uh, Petit Verdot, uh, Merlot, and Malbec. Um, and they're back in the day, they they used to really really uh, uh, be heavy on uh, including uh, Carmenere. Um, and so that's, that's more a wine that you'll see um, in South America, um, produced in, in Chile um, and other uh, place, places, countries within uh, South America. Um, but uh, Bordeaux blend is going to be uh, a combination of those grapes, if not 50-50 Cabernet Sauvignon, Cabernet, uh, and a, a Merlot, okay? Um, there also uh, can be uh, uh, several other regions that have blends like I mentioned earlier, uh, like uh, the Cote de Rhone with the Grenache Syrah Mubedra. Um, when you hear someone mention uh, uh, Rioja um, in Spain, they're also speaking about uh, a potentially a blend, right? It can be 100% uh, Tempranillo, um, or it can be a combination of Tempranillo and Garnacha, uh, which we know uh, in the States uh, or Australia as Grenache, um, and even France. Okay. Does anybody have any questions uh, so far? I'm happy to stop. I know I've been talking for a little bit. Okay, all right. So uh, there are a couple of other regions that I wanted to kind of highlight um, here specifically. Um, so Chianti, um, has anybody heard of, of Chianti um, and Chianti Classico? So there's two different, okay, awesome, awesome. There are, there are, there are kind of two different uh, distinctions when it comes to Chianti and Chianti Classico. Um, uh, the Chianti uh, is, is made of the uh, Sangiovese grape. Okay, so that's the first thing to, to kind of know. But when you see Classico come after it, that's going to be the most genuine representation of that specific grape, right? So in terms of price point, when you just see Chianti on a label, right, it's going to be kind of like at your entry level. Um, and then when you go Classico, um, you're going to the higher quality um, and that price point kinds of, kinds of it rise, raises. Um, and and it, there are different types of uh, grapes that kind of follow that same kind of format. Um, I don't know if uh, there are any uh, folks uh, in this group that uh, may know about the grape Nebbiolo. Um, but Nebbiolo was grown in several different places around the world, but most notably um, in Italy, right? Um, and there can be a Nebbiolo that's grown in the Longue, for example, and they'll label it as Longue Nebbiolo specifically. So that's gonna be your entry level. And then you have your kind of Barolo um, and then Barbaresco. Again, when we're talking about um, the old world, we're generally referring to uh, regions and specific places, villages, even as you get into um, uh, France. So Barolo and Bar Barresco are also producers of those same exact uh, varietals, Nebbiolo, 
Um, but those price points tend to be a little bit higher um, as you get more and more specific um, to a place, right? And think about it this way, and this is what I always tell people is that, you know, each of us come from somewhere um, in the world and somewhere in the world. And but, you know, a lot of us specifically coming from Dickinson College have moved about the world and moved about the country. Um, but if you were to have a conversation with someone and they were to ask you where you're from or where you feel that you have your your roots, you know, what is the best or most genuine version of you? Uh, you tell them that specific place, right? That's where you're gonna get the most genuine Dwight expression, right? And that version of Dwight typically will be, or the version of you typically will be the most expensive, the most authentic. And so folks are gonna pay more for that expression coming from that specific place. Does that make sense? I hope so. Okay, I see a question here. Okay, uh, so John and Nancy Taylor um, are asking, do you agree with the old adage often quoted that uh, you should avoid labels with pictures of animals on them because it's not a serious wine? Yeah, I've heard that before, absolutely. Um, and uh, I would say no. I think specifically here um, in, in the United States, um, we have a lot of folks that are, are really, really creative and a lot of producers that are, are, are trying um, you know, some, some really new things, unique things. They're um, uh, uh, marrying a lot of different uh, types of uh, art, right? And, and wine at the end of the day is art. So they'll collaborate with artists um, of all types, visual artists, musical artists, to kind of come up with uh, labels and specific um, uh, 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 wine themes, um, but it really doesn't have much to do with um, the actual quality of the uh, the, the the wine um, at all. So um, I, I typically don't subscribe to it. Um, but you know, again, it, you know, it, it's all a matter of taste, right? Um, and uh, I I personally wouldn't want to write off a a wine based on uh, the label. Although you know, I can certainly appreciate. Uh, creativity, um, but also tradition as well. Um, and, and, and that's what you're going to see, you know, in that old world is, you know, kind of like the very basic writing of, uh, you know, where it comes from um, and the vintage. And, th and that's really it. You're not going to get all those pictures. Um, but, you know, here in the States and in some other new world uh, types of countries uh, you'll, or, or places, you'll definitely get more of that kind of creative, outside of the box, innovative um, types of expressions in art. Good question. Um, what is the average I should spend on a bottle of wine just for dinner? I would say that that would depend on uh, of the day of the week. Um, you know, a Tuesday night wine, uh, I don't expect personally to, to spend a whole lot of money of, on, uh, on um, but you know, my Friday weekend wine, uh, I may turn it up a little bit, right? Um, it, when it comes to, you know, your Sunday brunches, um, uh, has anybody ever had a mimosa? Um, if, if, you, if you've had a mimosa before, uh, they're not pouring the most expensive champagne into your glass, right? In fact, uh, it, it's likely not champagne at all. It's going to be your acavas um, or Prosecco, uh, and those are going to be at a lower price point. Um, but if I am celebrating um, a, a graduation, if I'm celebrating a special occasion of some sort, that's when I'll spend that money on the champagne. Um, and again, you know, you're talking about a price point at the Cava Prosecco level of about, you know, $15 or less and champagne $50 or more. Okay. And, and that's, that's the difference. Um, there are, you know, different methods and in, 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 in the way that those specific types of wines are produced, um, which uh, makes it, you know, more expensive or less expensive. Again, I think I talked to, to this uh, spoke to this at the last presentation, but um, uh, wines that are less mechanized, meaning more hands, more manual processes are put into place, will typically be your more uh, uh, expensive wines. And those that are more mechanized, meaning they're, you know, um, the factory line type of uh, pr produced uh, will be your least expensive. So the barefoots, the yellowtails, et cetera. Okay. That's there. So, you know, 
Hey, when it comes to your your own dinner, I'd say you use your discretion. Discretion again, it's 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 a, a completely subjective, um, and and you know based on uh, what you're comfortable with. But you know, my I, I like to start you know around twenty dollars for a quality bottle of wine, um, and then I'll go up from there based on where I am in the week. Good question. Um, Paul has Rabin and the wines are excellent. Yep, yep. Yeah, there are definitely some, some really good wines out there um, that, that have, you know, fun uh, labeling um, and, you know, some really classic producers, um, old school producers here in the States um, like Stag's Leap uh, that have, you know, deer on them as well. Um, so I wouldn't write one off uh, based on the label. Uh, what new producers and or newly released wines should we try? Um, I think there are a few that I'm a big fan of. So a new producer um, that I really like is Domaine uh, Delacote. Um, and their first vintage, I believe, was back in 2014, um, if I'm not mistaken. Um, but this was uh, a, 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 uh, a wine that, uh, not a wine, but a producer that I came across by watching the uh, Psalm uh, series, the Psalm movies. Um, and this uh, bottle specifically right here is one of the first offerings um, or the first uh, vintages of this specific uh, offering. So um, it's called DDLC, uh, Domaine de la Cote. Um, it's a Pinot Noir and it's from the Santa Rita Hills um, in California. Um, I, I got a few of these and I'll be holding on to um, at least one or two uh, for a future time. Uh, but um, Domaine Delacote is definitely a producer um, that I would uh, recommend. Uh, Rajat Parr um, is the specific uh, producer there. Um, he's also uh, responsible for uh, Sandy wines as well. Um, and Pieri Rossi, uh, which are uh, some new wines coming out too. Um, so that'll definitely be one. Uh, I saw a new chat come up. Yeah. Uh, so how do you think that the California wild, uh, wildfires will affect the wines from there? So believe it or not, a lot of vines, um, you know, are, are, are kind of fire resistant. Um, they're generally, uh, uh, generally not affected. Um, and it's, it has to do that it's a pretty scientific stuff, but um, the, the, the grapes themselves actually uh, protect themselves um, from, you know, smoke taint, what we call smoke taint. Um, and, uh, you know, obviously, you know, uh, the grapes need specific, um, they have specific needs right, uh, you need water, you need sunshine, you need um, that carbon dioxide. And if the clouds, the smoke clouds are not allowing the sun uh, to, to, to ripen the specific uh, uh, grapes um, at a specific rate, um, then they'll definitely be affected. But I think overall, because of the winemaking uh, process that a lot of you know, farmers, a lot of uh, winemakers can make up for some of those um, elements um, overall, and they're not generally um, uh, affected by the wine. Um, do some folks say they do get some uh, level of uh, uh, like smoke taint um, in the flavor profile, perhaps, but honestly, a lot of that can be mitigated um, in the winery. Um, so it won't typically uh, be affected in that way. Great question, though. What are the best steps one can take to train your palate? Uh, the first thing I'll say is drink. Um, you have to be able to drink um, at, at, at a, a certain level, um, to, to kind of start. Um, and like I said, um, there, there is actually a challenge out there. It's a 34, uh, varietal or style of wine challenge that, uh, Madeline Paquette put together, which basically, um, uh, showcases, you know, a variety of different wines, a variety of different, uh, places. Um, and I'll send that out in the chat after, um, or, or the email a chain uh, with Andrew later so you can have that. But, you know, my recommendation would be to drink uh, uh, from uh, different producers with the same uh, varietal, right? Um, so if it's a Pinot Noir that you're drinking, uh, buy a Pinot Noir from Oregon, buy a Pinot Noir from uh, Carneros, uh, California, 
buy a Pinot Noir from Argentina and buy a Pinot Noir from France, right? And typically, you know, uh, in France, we call it Burgundy, right? Uh, so if you buy those different, those four different uh, types of wine, you'll notice distinct uh, uh, differences um, between uh, each of them. Um, why? Again, because of the terroir, uh, because of where the, 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 the wine actually comes from, because of the tradition, um, uh, you know, how it's specifically made, because of how it's stored, uh, because of the specific year, the weather, the climate in that specific place. Um, all those things will, will um, kind of help to train and develop your palate. Cabernet, from Sauvign uh, Cabernet Sauvignon from uh, California does not taste the same as Cabernet uh, Sauvignon from uh, Virginia. Um, and it doesn't taste the same in South America. Um, so the more that you're able to kind of put all of those uh, wines up, and we would call it probably a horizontal tasting, um, you know, you'd be able to kind of uh, decipher and decode, you know, the slight differences between how that specific grape can be offered uh, with different producers. Um, and even in different vintages in different years, right? Um, you can add that as well. Um, to decant or not to decant, that is a question. Yeah. What is your rule of thumb and what about wine with a little sediment in the bottle, right? So uh, let's start at the, the very uh, last part of that question. Uh, sediment is not a bad thing. Um, it is caused by tartaric acid um, or tartrates. Um, we call them wine crystals um, that develop. Uh, and a lot of times you'll see on your kind of higher quality bottles, there's a, a little kind of round uh, uh, kind of uh, divot in the bottom, it's called a punt, all right? That kind of helps the, the sediment uh, reside at the bottom of the bottle um, and separate from the rest of the wine. It's kind of undesirable, but if you're getting that last pour out, a lot of times you'll find that um, in your glass. Um, so completely harmless, um, just a part of, you know, the, uh, the tartaric acid developing in the bottle. Not a bad thing. Um, the next part of that question, uh, the rule of thumb around decanting, if I have a, a, an older wine, I'm typically going to be um, decanting it for a little bit. Or um, if I have a, a super young wine, I want that wine to breathe because that, the, the, the molecules are so tight. Um, it hasn't had a chance to kind of get on its arc. Um, and what I mean by arc is that wine essentially wants to turn to, to, to the vinegar, right? And, and we use um, you know, the, the, the cellar um, to get wine to a specific point. So the winemaker wants the, you to experience wine at its highest peak, all right? And a lot of times, you know, the youngest uh, wines are going to be down kind of in this section. And then the downside, your older wines, right? If they're not meant to be drunk old or be aged, that's how you're going to experience the wine. Um, so at both of these sides, at both of these ends, um, you typically don't want to um, be drinking it um, in that specific way, but you want to hit it right here in the, kind of in the, in the middle. Um, and what decanting can do is allow for you to experience more of that kind of middle uh, high point of the arc. Um, so I would say uh, wine's older than uh, 10 years old, I'm decanting, um, or a, a, a super full bodied red, um, and uh, wines that are less than two years old, um, I'm going to be decanting red wines. Uh, we don't typically decant uh, white wines. Um, there are some uh, like a, a Viognier, for example, that you may uh, be able to let breathe a little bit um, in that way. Um, that could be drunk at uh, room temperature. Um, but um, other than that, um, white wines aren't decanted. Um, so that's my general uh, rule of thumb for me. Yeah, how do you know when a, a wine is past its prime? Yeah, it, it, and how long can you hold well-stored wines, um, reds and certain whites like Riesling? Um, so there's a, there's a general rule of thumb here. Uh, when it comes to storing um, or aging uh, wines, wines with higher acidity and higher tannins are wines that you can typically age, right? 
what I mean by acidity is the feeling that you get when you drink a specific wine, right? So if you're, uh, if you have your glass right now, go ahead and do this with me. Um, go through your process, see, smell, taste. Swirl the wine around your mouth a little bit and then lean forward. Okay. When you lean forward, I want you to notice what happened inside of your mouth, right? Did a little bit of saliva uh, accumulate um, in, in, you know, around your jawline? If it did, that is acid, right? Um, that means it's a, a wine with a, a good level of acidity, right? Those are the types of wines that you can age. If you felt a lot of grip um, at the roof of your mouth, uh, you felt your, your, your mouth, your top lip kind of grip your teeth, that is tannin, right? So that's the backbone of red wine. Acid or acidity would be the backbone of a white wine. Again, both of those things you can typically lay down. So Riesling, you're gonna lay down because of its super, super racy acidity. Um, the same goes for you know Cabernet Sauvignons um, when it comes to tannin. Um, and, and combination of acidity as well. Um, like for example, um, in a cooler climate, a more moderate clim climate, um, you can get Cabernet Sauvignon that you can lay down and has a, a solid level of acidity um, in addition to uh, tannin. Um, so that's my general rule of thumb uh, there. And uh, not all wine that uh, is produced is, is meant uh, to be um, aged. Like I said, um, uh, your, your Pinot Noirs, for example, very, very popular to be aged, but Beaujolais, right, which is, is essentially like little cousin, just to the south of Burgundy, um, which is the Gamay grape, uh, would not be uh, a wine that you would want to age. That would be a red wine that you would want to drink fairly young. Um, so that's that there. Um, how do I know when a wine is past its prime? Um, you can generally tell if it's if it's lacking life, right? If it's lacking uh, those kind of aromas um, and, and and flavor profiles. If the finish is 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 short. Um, if there is some sort of taint or wine fault, um, you know. So there's something called Brett uh, that that um, you know allows the wine to smell like. Um, kind of uh, a cardboard or, or a wet dog. Um, if a wine is corked, for example, those are wines that you don't typically want to drink um, and or hang on to in any way, shape, or form. Um, but generally, if a wine, if I'm not getting a lot of life from that specific wine, um, because it's generally, you know, aging and breathing, um, I, I'm, I'm not going to spend any time on it. Good question. How much faith do you put into uh, wine ratings or scores? And is there a rating system or app do you think is most accurate? Um, so I don't put much into wine ratings or scores. Um, I think everyone's palate uh, is, is, is different. Um, if you are gonna follow um, specific ratings, I would say follow the magazine ratings. Um, so uh, wine enthusiast, um, Wine and Spirits magazine, uh, Decanter, um, uh, some of the critics like uh, James Suckling, Stephen Spurrier, um, Jancis Robinson, uh, specifically, um, Robert Parker, right? Those folks have been a while around wine and they're drinking and tasting uh, hundreds of wines, probably a day, uh, honestly, but uh, certainly by the week. Um, and they can give you um, solid descriptions or descriptors about the wines that they're drinking um, and, and have trained palates. You know, some folks are certified and others are not, um, but they do have experience in, in tasting wines and traveling around the world uh, doing it. So um, I would say, you know, if you're going to rely on scores, rely on uh, those that do come from, you know, those folks that I just mentioned. Um, but it's not everything uh, because, again, those folks are their own people. Um, and they have their own specific palettes. Um, uh, and, um, you know, when it comes to the apps, the Vino um, specifically um, uh, will give you a, a solid uh, kind of read as to how popular a specific wine is, um, you know, by the numbers of reviews um, and how many people 
um, have reviewed those specific wines or, or been on that specific app. Um, but again, those are people just like you and me um, who you know can uh, make suggestive uh, subjective ratings on their own. Um, so it, you know it doesn't tell the whole story. Um, I'd say you just have to experience it uh, yourself. Um, can you gauge the quality of a wine by a specific score? No. Um, but can you gauge if, a, 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 if people like it? Yes. Um, and, and, and so, you know, if you want to start there, it's a solid entry level. It's a solid kind of entry point. A great question. Are there any other questions that folks may have? No, we have about five minutes left. And you feel free to put any of those questions um, that you may have in the chat. Um, oh, I, I see Andrew did put in those uh, uh, recommendations. Um, and these are recommendations that I specifically uh, made uh, based on the season, right? Um, you know, I know that most of us probably are, are, are here on the East Coast, um, and so wintertime is coming, and, you know, I think, you know, when it comes to curling up next to the fire with a nice bottle of wine, you know, I typically think about uh, a red, uh, although I did include uh, two whites and a champagne um, on there as well. Um, but uh, Austin Hope, really high quality producer, there are a variety of different price points on this list. Um, Austin Hope will start somewhere around uh, $45 or so. Um, the Born of Fire uh, will be about 20. Abstract will be about 35 to 40. Chateau La Roque, it's a Bordeaux blend. That's a very popular one. It's about 25. Uh, the same goes for those uh, next two, uh, the Shiraz from Australia, Zinfandel from uh, California. Um, Evesham Wood is a, a Willamette Valley Pinot Noir. Um, there's a Chianti Classico on that list, Sangiovese, um, GH Mum, a uh, very popular producer, uh, Champagne, that starts around $45, um, Stag's Leap, around $30, and the uh, Craggy Range uh, from New Zealand, uh, Sauvignon Blanc, um, that's going to be in the, uh, around $20, $21 as well. Um, so those are just a, a few recommendations I have there. Um, yeah, I so yeah, I I am a I am a a, a waiter's corkscrew two stage wine opener uh, user. Um, I, I typically don't use the uh, the guy with the arms, um, and I don't use an electron uh, opener. Um, not that there's anything bad about those, but I, I like you know when it comes to you know the layers and complexity, I like to be able to cut the foil uh, myself. And go through the process. Being a psalm um, in a wine shop uh, in in Baltimore, I, I have to kind of do it. And pe people tend to like um, uh, that presentation uh, as well. Um, and I I, I don't um, stay away from it in my own home either. Um, so yes, this is my preferred uh, wine tool. Um, they're not necessarily expensive. Um, you know, they can get up there if you want them to, but uh, you can get a nice basic. Um, uh, high quality producer, uh, high quality, high quality produced uh, tool for no more than fifteen dollars if you want. Um, if you had to choose, what is the base wine tasting, best wine wine tasting experience you've had while visiting a vineyard? Um, I definitely have to say um, RDV out here um, in in Virginia uh, was one of my uh, my favorite experiences. Um, at a winery. I've, I've been to a few in Napa as well that, that are probably on par, but, um, and most recently in my mind, RDV, um, they only produce about uh, four, four different wines. Um, they're located, I believe in Delaplain, uh, Virginia, uh, which is about two hours south, uh, an hour and a half south of, of Washington, DC. Um, but, you know, just in terms of, of the property, um, the class, the, the way that they, um, uh, present the wines, their education, the care that they put into the bottles, um, the scenery. Uh, I think it's just fantastic. They mainly focus on uh, Bordeaux varietals um, and, and, and blends. Um, 
and they do offer at that uh, specific winery other producers as well, um, you know, so and, and, and very, very high quality producers. So um, and they pour that for you there. Um, it's 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 pretty exclusive experience and would highly suggest it um, if you wanted to take a weekend down there. Um, there are certainly many, many wineries um, in that um, area and even further south as you go to Charlottesville. Um, and Charlottesville is an AVA called um, the Monticello Wine Trail, um, where you're going to get, you know, really, really high uh, quality um, uh, wineries um, offering a lot of the same types of styles of wine, um, like Bordeaux, um, but there are also some Rhone varietals like uh, Viognier um, and Grenache Syrah uh, that are offered there as well. Um, we're, we're pretty famous for Cabernet, Cabernet Franc. Um, in this area. So I definitely try those. Great question. Anyone else? So yeah, I know, I know that we don't have a, a you know, a ton of time on these things. Uh, you know, I'm happy to answer any questions, um, you know, from you all via email. I can uh, put my uh, information here in the chat so that you can reach out to me at any point in time. I'm also on Instagram um, at the Daffarina file as well. Um, just how, uh, you know, I, I kind of got that name just from in my initials, Dwight Alexander file. Uh, so DAP, and then Anina file is somebody who studies wine, enjoys wine, et cetera. So it just uh, kind of all, uh, mashed up in a line. And actually my first name, Dwight, comes from um, the Greek word uh, theot, which comes from Dionysus, which is also uh, the god of wine. Uh, so um, I, I guess I was meant for this somehow, some way. Are there any other questions for Dwight before we wrap up this evening? Thank you so much for uh, for for joining. Um, I wish you know we could uh, meet in person, um, but um, you know all the best to you. Happy holidays! I hope that you all enjoy it. Um, it's good to spend time with uh, fellow Dickinsonians. And again, uh, please reach out if you do have any questions. Uh, Want to stop by my wine shop, Vino, um, in Baltimore. Once uh, we open back up, we're only open for carryout uh, right now. But uh, please reach out. Don't hesitate. Thank you, everybody, for attending tonight. We appreciate it. Thank you. Take care, all. Thanks, Andrew. Of course. Thank you. All right.